this week on Just Solutions. A wave of anti-LGBTQ legislation is sweeping across the country, from Florida's Don't Say Gay Bill, which bans classroom discussion about sexual orientation or gender identity in early grades, to numerous states attempting to outlaw gender-affirming healthcare for transgender youth. The Human Rights Campaign is tracking more than 200 anti-LGBTQ plus equality bills around the country, and they say the numbers keep growing. Our guest today is Catherine Oakley, HRC's State Legislative Director and Senior Counsel. She focuses on passing non-discrimination laws at the state and local levels and combating anti-LGBTQ legislation in state legislatures. From Free Speech TV, Just Solutions. Kate, it's so great to have you with us. Thank you very much for being our guest on Just Solutions today. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I know that HRC was concerned a year ago because 2021 was shaping up to be a bumper year for anti-LGBTQ equality legislation and 2022 is building on that and could even surpass it. 35 states, it looks like at this point, have introduced some form of legislation. How big an issue is this? I mean, is this a bigger problem than we saw in 2021? Is this a multi-year movement that we're seeing? Unfortunately, yes, it is. Um, Since 2015, we've been seeing more anti-LGBTQ legislation than we had seen before with uh, hundreds of bills, unfortunately, introduced uh, each year that are attacking the LGBTQ community. But over the last three legislative sessions, we have seen a particular focus on uh, transgender people and particularly transgender youth. So unfortunately, In 2020, we had a record number of anti-LGBTQ bills introduced with 79 uh, bills introduced that year. And then as you say, in 2021, we had 150, which then set a new record. This year, we have more than 140 and it's only April. So it is possible and in fact likely that we will be passing that threshold again this year. As you said, the target of a lot of this legislation their children, young people, and that many are transgender young people. And we'll talk about two specific types of legislation because we're seeing copycat legislation playing out in multiple states. Let's talk about the gender affirming medical care and how that is now being outlawed. First of all, there is huge amount of scaremongering on the part of the proponents of these measures as if toddlers and and kindergartners were being brought in for surgery. When the reality is that very often This is just mental health care for young people. Take us through exactly what uh, gender affirming health care is and what's being targeted. Yeah, this is a great point because for kids, for transgender kids, transition is almost entirely a social process. It is about using a name that fits that child's identity. It's about using pronouns that fit that child's identity. It may impact the way that they dress or present themselves. And yes, you're right. It can also include mental health care, but that's what we're talking about for kids who are really young. For kids who then are are approaching puberty, what may happen at that point is that they may be prescribed something that's called puberty blockers. And those prevent a child from going through puberty in a way that would impose permanent changes on their body. It's sort of a pause button. And that pause button is really important because it allows that young person to reach an age where they can give truly informed consent over the more permanent changes that are part of some people's medical transition plan. And so the opponents, you're absolutely right, are putting out all of this misinformation as if there are, they love to talk about, for example, sterilization. They're really trying to make people afraid of what it means to be a trans young person and what kinds of things the people who support trans young people, like parents and doctors, what kinds of things those people are authorizing uh, to, to happen with this child. The truth is that a doctor a a doctor, and by the way, this treatment is supported by the American Academy of Pediatrics. It is, uh, I'm sorry, the American Pediatrics Association, the actual Pediatrics Association, the uh, American Medical Association, um, the, uh, uh, the Psychology Association. Like this is, these treatments are age appropriate, 
They are medically necessary and they in some cases can be life saving. They are absolutely not <laughs> uh, performing surgery on kids. There's no sterilization happening on young kids. This is something where any of the more permanent treatments are, are or treatments with more permanent effects are held off until the young person is able to give truly informed consent. They're old enough to be able to do that. Many people are familiar with what was happening in, in Texas around this, but there are several other states that have copycat legislation. So where is this playing out specifically targeting um, parents and medical providers who are trying to support transgender youth with uh, gender affirming health care? What, what states are introducing this legislation? Yeah, we have uh, more than 40 bills introduced across the country this year that would limit uh, the ability of transgender youth to access medically necessary gender affirming age appropriate care. Um, some of the places where we're seeing that legislation include um, Alabama, which is a one vote away at this point from passing uh, legislation that would make it a felony for doctors to provide gender affirming care to transgender youth. And again, this is best practice age appropriate care. Uh, that felony penalty would come with between one and 10 years in jail. Um, it has already passed the Senate and House Committee, so it is just one full House vote away from going to the governor. Um, that is one of the pieces of legislation that it, we're really concerned about. Um, earlier this year, uh, there was a bill introduced in Idaho that would it actually have imposed life in prison on a parent who allowed, I'm sorry, on a, on a person who provided gender affirming care to a transgender youth. And as you say, in Texas, what actually happened there wasn't legislation, it was a really lawless executive action by the governor instructing the Department of Family Services to consider it child abuse if a parent was providing this age appropriate, best practice, medically necessary care to their transgender child. Um, and that means that the, that is that would impact the parents, it would impact the providers. Child abuse obviously also comes with uh, considerations for mandatory reporters across the state. And it's really another example of how Texas is trying to get folks to turn on each other and turn them into the government um, for uh, practicing constitutionally protected rights. I'd like to talk about the impact on the young people themselves of all of this legislation and what's ironic, and we will dig into this more. What is ironic is the fact that these laws are being framed as a protect our children type of legislation. We'll talk about that because that has uh, historical overtones. But when the Trevor Project, which is a nationwide advocacy group that advocacy group that works to support the mental health of LGBTQ young people, they say that LGBTQ youth are four times more likely to uh, attempt suicide as their peers. And actually for transgender young people, those statistics can be even greater but they say that's not necessarily because of their gender identity issues or their sexual orientation. Rather, it's because of how society treats them. So when we have this type of rhetoric, when we have these type of laws being passed, what is the impact on young people? What are you hearing at the HRC? Yeah, that's a great question because this is it's hugely detrimental. It's hugely detrimental. Um, there's a uh, transgender girl who has done a lot of advocacy with uh, over the course of her lifetime in Texas. Um, she's 12 years old and she uh, has been advocating now for three sessions in Texas, which is every other year. So almost half of her life, she has been going to the Texas legislature and trying to help them understand what it means to be a trans girl. You know, this isn't something Thing that she wants in her life. Uh, I, she's, I, I'm sure, has many things that she would rather be doing than driving up to the Texas legislature and trying to prove to them that she is worthy of their respect and, in fact, should not be discriminated against. And it's heartbreaking to see kids who have to do this because if they don't, the, these legislators have no idea about what the consequences of these bills are. And she has been incredibly brave and she's been a fabulous advocate because she comes and she really tells the story about what it what it's like to be her. One of the things that she has said is that these bills are incredibly scary and that she there was a piece of legislation that failed in Texas that would have uh, would have done basically what the gov governor ended up doing via executive order 
And she said if that bill passed, she it, it made her want to disappear. Um, it's so scary and hard to be six years old and to have to tell these folks who are so much more powerful than you are that they need to leave you alone, <laughs> that they don't understand who you are and that their actions are harmful. And, you know, we see this across the country. Earlier this year, um, South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem sponsored a bill in the South Dakota legislature that prevents trans girls from being able to participate in sports consistent with their gender identity. She was extremely proud of this bill. She did a whole national tour, a whole national uh, speaking engagement about it, you know, trying to make sure that people understood that this was something she cared deeply about. Well, after the session concluded, after the bill had passed, after her chief of staff had likened trans kids playing sports to terrorism, um, a reporter asked her if she had any comment about why trans uh, LGBTQ people in South Dakota had really negative health outcomes, why South Dakota had some of the highest levels of depression among LGBTQ people in the country. And she said, oh, well, that seemed very sad and she had no idea why. Well, you know, there's a correlation between these things. The The rhetoric that goes around these bills, the idea that you would call uh, a transgender kid who's playing sports, the idea that you would liken them to a terrorist. I mean, that kind of rhetoric has consequences. You're talking about children who can hear you when you speak. And it's really scary to be kids who are targeted. The Utah governor Governor Cox recently vetoed one of these anti-transgender sports bans, and his answer um, when, when asked why he thought the veto was necessary was that in his understanding, there are four trans kids playing sports in Utah, one of whom is a trans girl. And he really led with compassion and said, how would it feel to be the four kids in Utah who have inspired this kind of vitriol, who have had this directed at them? They didn't ask for this. They're just kids. They're just kids who have told the truth about who they are and who have found people in the world who love and support them and uplift them. And to have the legislature be coming after them, it's a terrifying thing. And it's really not something that is fair or that any of these kids deserve. I'm so glad you mentioned Governor Spencer Cox and that oh, that veto, in fact, that was overturned by the state legislature and that ban is actually still going into effect, I believe, in yeah. July. He said in his veto letter, rarely has so much fear and anger been directed at so few. And you mentioned there it was four children in the state of Utah. One of them was a transgender girl. Yeah. And in fact, last year, the Associated Press reported that lawmakers in more than 20 states couldn't actually share a local example of when a transgender student athlete participating in sports was causing a problem. So yeah. this is not a problem that is actually existing. This is legislation in search of a problem. So where is this all coming from? Where is this wave of anti-trans particularly bills stemming from? Yeah, well, look, I think that people, including myself, have very strong attachments to Title IX, have very strong attachments to women's sports. Um, and, you know, women's sports has a lot of challenges, inc including chronic underfunding, um, sexual abuse. There are lots of things that women's sports really needs to be able to succeed and to move to the next level that it doesn't have. None of the problems facing women's sports have anything to do with transgender participation. And the truth is, we don't have to have this conversation in the hypothetical. Um, there have been some high profile athletes recently who've done very, very well for themselves. And folks hold them up as an example of, well, this is a this is proof that the rules are broken, where in fact, we don't have to have this conversation in the hypothetical. There have been hundreds and hundreds of trans athletes who have competed at every level. They have played Played sports at school. They have um, played sports in college. They have participated at the uh, at the professional level. And these trans athletes, these trans women athletes, have not destroyed women's sports. They have not harmed female athletes. In fact, uh, women's sports, I, I would hope more than anybody, understands about the value of inclusion and having an opportunity to play. And I do think it's important to emphasize that uh, most of these bills are about school sports. They impact kids who are kids, who are really 
they're just kids and they're just kids who want to be able to play soccer after school with their friends. Um, the idea that this is becoming all about, you know, who gets a college scholarship, you know what, 98% of people who play sports at the high school level don't go on to play in college. I played sports at the high school level. I did not go on to play in college. I did it so that I could hang out with my friends, that I could do something healthy with my body. I could get exercise. You learn all kinds of things from sports, including the value of a challenge and discipline and hard work and practice and leadership. And those are the reasons that we have athletics as part of a school program, as part of an educational program. And there's no reason that trans kids can't also benefit from that. Trans kids participation doesn't threaten cisgender girls' uh, ability to succeed. It's all false. So the reason that we're seeing it now is because there's a very small group of folks who care really deeply about rolling back LGBTQ equality. And these are gro groups like the Alliance Defending Freedom, the American Principles Project, the Heritage Foundation, folks who have been think tanks who have been pushing out legislation that would harm LGBTQ people and who have been doing that for decades. These are the same folks who supported criminalization of same-sex re relationships. They opposed marriage equality. They supported weddings, weddings related services refusals and other religious refusals. They supported bathroom bills and all of their work has pivoted from every time they lose a question of, for example, marriage equality, they lost on the question of marriage equality. And so where do they go from there? Well, religious refusals and bathrooms for trans people. And the place that they have landed right now is on attacking trans kids. They are trying to take the social supports that tra trans kids have and knock them out one by one. So whether as with the medical care bans that we discussed, it's about taking away the ability of their parents to support them, taking away the ability of their doctors to support them, or with the sports, if it's about taking away their ability of their coaches and their teammates to support them. And then looking at some of the other bills that we're seeing across the country in terms of take, taking away their ability to use the bathrooms consistent with their gender identity at school, taking away their ability to read books that have characters like them in them, um, taking away their ability to learn history that has people like them in them, and in fact, even taking away their own teachers, guidance counselors as people who, that they can come out to, that they can be safe with, that they can have conversations with. That's what the opposition to LGBTQ equality wants. They wanna knock out all of those social supports so that that kid is left alone. And that's because they don't believe that being trans is a real thing. And they are hoping that without those supports, those kids will cease to be trans, which is simply not how it works. Well, we'd love to hear from our viewers. Let us know your thoughts on this. Uh, drop us a comment and connect with us on social media. What do you think about this wave of anti-LGBTQ legislation that we're seeing sweeping across the country and so much of it particularly targeting young people? Well, there's so much attention being paid, Kate, to what's happening in Florida and the Don't Say Gay Bill. And when we talk about the importance of language, I think we should clarify exactly what that bill is. It doesn't even say LGBTQ in the legislation, but of course, the impact is on anyone who is not heterosexual and cisgender. So what is the Don't Say Gay Bill? And we'll talk a little bit more about its origins. Yeah, so it does two things. The first thing it does is it forbids any conversation. So that's both curriculum and conversation in the classroom. Um, that includes the uh, includes any topics related to sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, important to point out, by the way, that uh, that straight people also have a sexual orientation and that cisgender people also have a gender identity. But we do know that this is uh, pointed at the LGBTQ community, which is why it has become known as the Don't Say Gay Bill. Um, we also uh, encourage folks to say Don't Say Gay or Trans Bill because it is about both sexual orientation and gender identity. And it is very much about trying to erase both uh, LG uh, erase the entire LGBTQ community um, in those conversations. So the first piece for forbids any conversation in terms of curriculum or conversation in the classroom around LGBTQ issues in grades K to three. Then from grades four and above, it says that all conversation has to be, quote, age appropriate, which is not defined in the bill. 
I um, don't think anybody would disagree that conversation with young folks always needs to be age appropriate. I think that's an area which we can all agree. I think the real challenge on that question is what does it mean to be age appropriate? And the unfortunate reality of that bill is that if you're a fourth grade teacher, and so you have the discretion to decide what's age appropriate, but you also know that if you say the wrong thing, that a parent in your class can sue you you are going to be catering to the person in your class who you think is the most likely to be offended by any mention whatsoever. And so, for example, if I'm a parent uh, of, a, of a child in this teacher's class and Ron DeSantis, Governor Ron DeSantis, is a parent of a child in that class, are they going to be more worried about what I think? Or are they going to be more worried about what he thinks? They're going to always be the most concerned about the person who's most likely to be offended, the person who's most likely to sue. And so they're going to have really a, a lot of fear and confusion over what they are allowed to say. And ultimately, it's going to have an incredible chilling impact because we know teachers are just not going to want to end up in a place where they're vulnerable to criticism or that their school district will be sued because they said something in class that one of the parents didn't agree with. It's setting up an impossible situation for the teacher and it's setting up a discriminatory situation for everyone. It's also important to say that the governor has really discussed this as being about quote unquote gender indoctrination. He's talking about the idea that kids are going to school and being basically um, sort of taught how to be LGBTQ. Um, and of course, again, that's not the way that this works. The idea that a person can't even acknowledge about sexual orientation or gender identity in a classroom, you know, I think there are some people who would say, okay, well, Maybe there is something to this idea that it's not appropriate to be talking about uh, queer identities in, in kindergarten. Well, in kindergarten, one of the big things that's often a topic is family. What did you what did you do over the weekend? Well, I went out and got ice cream with my two moms or uh, I have a, a, my dad's uh, brought home a brand new baby this weekend and I'm so excited. Those are conversations that wouldn't be allowed in the classroom. Other, other conversations that wouldn't be allowed is a young person saying, I would, uh, I'd like to use they, them pronouns. Um, what, what, what if one of the other kids says, well, why? <laughs> the teacher's going to have to figure out how to address all of these questions. It creates absolutely impossible situation for teachers. And it creates a, a scary environment for LGBTQ young people who are getting a message very clearly that who they are is wrong and taboo and not something that can be discussed in polite society. I mean, I'd like to talk a, a briefly where we're running out of time and we have so much to talk about because Kate, this is a massive, massive issue and it harks back to what happened really in the 1970s when we saw in California's public schools, there was this uh, organization, Defend Our Children, trying to purge uh, public classrooms of uh, gay teachers, essentially. And they used the same language as we're seeing playing out in Florida today, grooming, indoctrination, um, as if there's an agenda. You know, th these are all the, the, the vocabulary that, that the same groups are using today. Talk a little bit about that, about how this is being framed. It's also being framed as a parental rights issue by some of these conservative groups that you mentioned earlier, particularly the American Principles Project. And so when it's framed parent, like parental rights, but also they're using this language like grooming, like indoctrination, how damaging that is. Well, look, it's not about parental rights. And then that's that it, it the it's almost a joke, because if you look at what's happening in Texas, where the government has just said, basically, if I don't like if I don't personally approve of the kind of medical care that you, your pediatrician and your child have agreed is what's best in your child's best interest, we will just come and take your child away. I mean, that is the, the absolute opposite of supporting parents' rights. It's just absolutely the opposite. And you're not talking about abusive care, you're talking about best practice care that people just don't approve of. And that is a huge problem. In terms of those, the, the conversation about grooming and pedophilia, 
I do think that that's a really important um, underpinning of all of this conversation. And, you know, I mentioned this idea that uh, the opponents of equality are trying to knock out all of these social supports that transgender young people are receiving. And that it's not that they care about women's sports. I mean, the American Principles Project is not an advocate of women's sports. They've cared about women's sports for exactly as long as that's been politically convenient for them, which is three years because then they can pin all of the woes of women's sports on trans youth. So these are not advocates for women's sports. These are not uh, medical experts. These are people whose mission is to turn back the clock on matters of LGBTQ equality and acceptance. And so this is what they truly believe <laughs> that, uh, and it's the same rhetoric, yes, that these folks have believed over the course of many, many, many years. It's the same rhetoric they deployed to try to get teachers out of classrooms. It's the same rhetoric they deployed around trying to prevent same-sex relationships um, from being decriminalized. Same rhetoric they employed around marriage. I know it feels like such a long time ago, but that's the same rhetoric they used around marriage. So these are folks who truly believe that being LGBTQ is inherently sinful. It is inherently wrong. And they are trying to, frankly, lie and trick people into believing that these are all problems because they know that when they talk about pedophilia, about grooming, that people understand, oh, that's discrimination. <laughs> and so they've been pretty careful not to use that rhetoric up until the last few weeks. And then they've started saying the quiet part out loud. Um, Governor DeSantis's press secretary used the phrase uh, grooming when she said that anyone who opposed the Don't Say Gay or Trans bill was a groomer or supported grooming. And as you say, the American Principles Project just doubled down on that rhetoric just this week, um, saying that it's absolutely true. There are different kinds of grooming and the kind of, this is grooming if you talk about, uh, you know, indoctrinating uh, youth with uh, information about LGBTQ issues. I, it, it is it is absurd. It is ridiculous. It is the same tired tropes all over again. Um, and they're only saying this part out loud because they're getting frustrated. And I think they're being found out. And I also think that you can't go as far as Governor Abbott did in Texas. And you can't go as far as <laughs> Governor DeSantis did in Florida. You can't go that far without being willing to say at some degree, or, um, without telling on yourself, without saying that, yes, there is no place I won't go. There is nothing that I won't do in order to hurt LGBTQ people and try to turn back the tide on equality. Well, Kate, we just have 60 seconds left, and I do want to let people know what they can do to support this, particularly if people are in states where this isn't happening. I know HRC is involved in lawsuits in Florida, Arkansas, Mississippi, Tennessee. What can people do to help with uh, this anti-LGBTQ equality legislation? Yeah, well, you can always follow us for more information on social media and sign up you know, for more information. Um, but the number one thing I would suggest that you do is learn about what it means to be a trans kid. We have some great videos that I see you're sharing some of them right here. Like we have some great videos. It only takes a few minutes, but hear from these kids themselves um, and understand what it feels like to be in their shoes. And, you know, if you lead with compassion, there's a lot to learn. Um, these kids are wonderful and they don't deserve what's happening. Happening. So if you take a few minutes and just educate yourself and then ask other people in your circle to also watch, I think, um, you know, it will edify everyone. Um, and it's certainly a joy to see these kids celebrated um, for who they are, who they really are and, and what they really are all about, which is being kids. Well, hrc.org is the website and a lot of videos, a lot of resources and a lot more information about what is happening. But uh, Catherine Oakley, thank you very much for being our guest today on Just Solutions. Thank you so much for having me. And don't forget Just Solutions is also available as a podcast so you can listen anytime. Never miss an episode by subscribing to the podcast wherever you get them. And don't forget to join us same time, same place next week for another conversation from Free Speech TV's Just Solutions. Mm -hmm.